Well, the love of God and its impact on uh, not only the nations around us, but for our lives even today. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a gracious love. It's a, a love that's motivated by uh, giving us what we, we don't deserve. And that's a, a mind-blowing concept in its, own, in its own way. We are the objects of God's love. We're the objects also, were the objects of his wrath in time past. And the amazing thing is, he now looks upon us uh, with love and wants the best for us. He's always wanted the best for us. It's us the problem, usually. We tend to love people for who they are. If they're related to us, or what they're like, if they're good looking, or if they're nice to us, we, we tend to show a, a, a more uh, a loving attitude towards them. But if they're different, then that's a, a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. But this gracious love, this agape love, this seeking one another's highest good, is a love above all loves. And God shows that love towards us in the world <coughs> we are sinners. He allowed Christ to die for us. What a love. It ought to thrill us, it ought to move us, it ought to motivate us. That the wrath of God once were abode upon our heads, but now the grace of God has been dipped into our hearts. So God looks upon us graciously. The unlovely, the, God loves the unlovely, God loves the unlovable, and have been given free, unmerited, unearned, unmerited grace. Nothing in us. Nothing in me, nothing in you could attract God to us. And the very fact that in us, I would repel anything holy, anything righteous, and anything good. Some days it even repels ourselves if we've got any common sense. Anyway, Paul says, God and his grace has come to it. Paul could say, in my flesh, in me, dwells no good thing. Uh, that Romans chapter 7 passage is interesting. The things he wanted to do, he said, I don't do them. The things I don't want to do, he said, I end up doing those. Uh, just a, a, a mess, really. But while God hates sin, it was a love for the sinner that motivated him to send his son to die from the cross. And all these passages talk, talk about that. Jesus died for us because he loved us. God's love is seen in the Old Testament by his patience with Israel. Only an infinite God continued to love a people who constantly rejected him, which is an interesting concept, uh, a, very, a very powerful concept. Time after time after time, God sent a prophet uh, to the Israelite people, the prophet's message often was, you're a hard-headed, you're a, a, an obnoxious nation almost. Uh, you, you just don't want to serve the living God. You want to go your own way and do your own thing and trample over people. Uh, and uh, time after time after time, God could have so easily said, I've had enough. And just stopped it right there. But he didn't. Because ultimately he saw this our salvation, really. The Lord did not choose you and lavish his love on you because you are larger or greater than the other nations. You are the smallest of all nations. It was simply because the Lord loves you and because he is keeping the oath he has sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such amazing power from your slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. Understand therefore that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations. And constantly love those who love him and obey his commands. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 7. Uh, a lot of people in Israel today forget that passage. They thought, it, they, they thought they were special because they were special. But they were special because God made them special. They weren't special in all their own right. God's love is contrasted with that of human beings. Always intelligent. Sometimes we're moved by blind passion. or silly infatuation. Not so with God. His infinite wisdom always governs his love. And love therefore always works for our best interests. The object of God's love are many. He of course loves Christ. Jesus told his disciples, As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. God said his only begotten Son to the world, that while we live through him, he is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. And sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God stepped into history. Those who accept Christ are to be adopted to his family. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Mm -hmm. So we're children of God. Uh, Fast John, one day we need to have a look at Fast John, because it's just so powerful. <coughs> Some people say, I don't know, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I'm good enough to be saved. Fast John says, you are saved, more than saved. You are children of God, sons of God. Another expression of divine love is that repeated of forgiveness. Uh, Hezekiah even was said to sing, 
You have in your love for my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. You have cast all my sins behind my back. That's almost a New Testament passage, isn't it? He was Hezekiah in the Old Testament. But Paul could have written that, not Isaiah. Uh, uh, his love for us, for our soul, has uh, put all our sins behind us. Each time the Christian sins with a penitent heart, asks forgiveness, he may be assured that God will grant it because God keeps his promises. Why should, I bother, why should God bother with me when there are days I, even I uh, think I'm not worth it? Because God ultimately is a lover. His love motivates his grace, his free unmerited grace, poured into our hearts, the heart of us degenerate sinners. The poet said, What was there in me that could merit esteem or give the Creator delight? For as even so, Father, I ever must sing because it seemed good in thy sight. It just seemed good to God not to wipe us out. It seemed good to God to allow us the opportunity of salvation. And because he's a gracious God. That's why John could say, We love him because he first loved us. And that's the order. We ought not to put it right. We don't think God loves us because we love him. It's we love him because he loved us. And it's <coughs> great grace in Jesus. By what sinners he loved and gave. He loved us before we knew him. Before he, we even had an ounce <coughs> of love for him. And that's something I, I think sometimes we struggle with. We think sometimes when we get ourselves in a mess, how on earth can God love me? But the reality was, he loved us before we were doing things right. We loved us before, while we were still rejecting him, while we were still walking away from him. And if that's the case, if God loved us before we came to him, how much more is he going to love us now that we're his children? We have a special, unique relationship with him. Uh, you can't earn his love, but we accept his love, his gracious love. His love is eternal. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting <coughs> love. With an unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. He loved us before there was even an us. Uh, when only God, his foreknowledge, knew there would be a, a you or me, God loved us. He had chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In Jesus, if we, we think of, uh, if we want to travel to London, uh, every day, practically every hour of the day, there's a train leaves uh, Kipping Station for London. That train leaves whether we're on it or not on it. But the opportunity for us to get on it is there. And that's what God's given us. People are going to go to heaven whether we go or not in Christ. But we have the opportunity to accept the transport that God has, has given that will get us from this earth into the next eternity. God's love is gracious and eternal. It's also infinite. God is infinite wisdom and power and also in love. In other words, his love is unlimited. God is transcendent. You know that. what that means? It means he is above everything. If God is above everything, his love also is above everything too. It's beyond us. It's difficult for us to comprehend. We might strive to fathom his breadth, his length, his depth, and his great height. We realize that not, no one, even the greatest teaching of any preacher, could ever really express the true love of God. The highest mountain can't reach its heights, the deepest ocean can't delve its depths, the furthest crevice in space is not far enough for the love of God. It's higher than the heavens, it's deeper than the sea, and we can never exhaust his love. And that's an important thing to know when we're struggling with things, when we're struggling with each other. We need to recognize that God loves us and wants the best for us, he wants the best for everybody. The love of God in Christ laid down his life for each one of us. That's the way the love, that love has been dis displayed and demonstrates his love. It's the expression, the representation. Second Corinthians 5 says, For God was in Christ reconciling, bringing back the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And that's an amazing <coughs> message they've given us for ourselves to grasp first of all and then to pass that message on to other people. God is a reconciling God. He wants to bring us back to himself. And that's what the incarnation, Christ in the flesh, was really all about. He is God, God of God, light of light, and there for each one of us. Since God didn't spare even his own son, we gave him up for us. Won't God who gave Christ also give us everything else. That's your good passage in Romans chapter 8. 
Uh, have you ever seen a mother nursing her baby in the early uh, pictures of, of long time ago, uh, 1900s? She's tired, she nurses and feeds it, the little baby is plump, but he she herself looks gaunt and thin, and yet she doesn't complain. Because despite a lack of food, she's giving herself for her uh, baby. She doesn't whinge, in fact she looks down and gazes with eyes shining with happiness and pride at the little child that all her energies, all her love is being poured into. That's a tremendous demonstration. A uh, uh, mother's love for a, a, a child, <coughs> uh, an excellent represent, uh, representation of God's love for us. Okay? Uh, she's laying her life down for that child, and what God says, we the love of no man in this, a man lays down his life for his friend. Mm. It's often the case in times past, especially maybe during the war years, or even before the war years, especially in some of the, the uh, places we have in Britain, where a, a mother would ultimately give everything it was to eat to a child rather than eat herself. And slowly they would waste away, and, and hopefully the child would survive. It's just a crazy thing, but a, a parent, a mother, uh, a right mother, in the right frame of mind, will do anything to try and help their child survive. It's an interesting concept. God wants us to survive, and he gave that which is most precious for him, to him, the son. You think it's from sorry, Frank? So, no, no, oh, sorry, I was thinking. I, actually, Isaiah says that God's love is even greater than that. That's right. Can a, can a mother forget a nursing child? Yeah. He says, yes, but I won't, I won't forget you. That's right. That's why that's I, was, I was trying to bring that out. Well, you've got to come yeah. in. Yeah. Oh, it's the, it's, it's, it is. Uh, the mother, mm. that's, yeah. that's a reflection. That's the highest of human love. Yes. At its best. Uh, and right. and God highest. goes further. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, but, but God's love higher than that. Yeah. If, if that's the representation of a mother's love for a child, yeah. how much more is God's love for us. Okay. We, don't, we don't always appreciate that. Mm. That God is a giving God uh, and he wants to help us, he wants to enable us, he wants to empower us. It's our limitation in appreciating that. We've got to be hold of it. It's a problem. Mm. You know, God's, God's capable. It's us that's incapable. And uh, the cross is a crowning proof of God's love. John 3, 16, 17, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but he sent his son to save. And there's great love. If we don't allow the love of God to be kept and poured and inundate our hearts, if we should doubt the love of God, we need to look at Calvary. Look at, and look at it and see the form of the one hanging upon the tree, and that should remind us of the great love he has for us. John 31 says, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew these hours were to come, and should depart out of this world, not the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved, loved them unto the very end. Uh, the uh, picture in the garden there, when the guards come to get Jesus, uh, he says, who are you looking for? And they say, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, that's me. He says, let these go. They could have taken them all in. He says, that's me. Let these go. So I let his disciples go. Mm. I, he loved them to the end. That's very little love like that. Love that will love no matter what the cost. Love that will love no matter what we turn out like. Uh, no matter what we do or, or no matter what we might say. Right in the face of the one that's loving us. Jesus loved even Judas. Right at the very end. That's <coughs> interesting, isn't it? I, uh, <coughs> it's amazing. Uh, I've been a self child. When I was about 18, uh, I had a, I think, well I won't go into much too much detail, but anyway, <laughs> what it ended up was, was I, I took my mother by the throat and pinned her against the wall. Uh, and she still loved me. You know, uh, I'm not very proud of that. Mm. And, and uh, I suppose in some weird way, I, I was able to justify it at the time, but really there's no justification for it. I was wrong in doing that, no matter how, what it was, what was being said or what was being done that created that situation. I was still wrong in doing that, because nobody, nobody really should uh, treat their mother uh, in that way. Uh, and it's a bit like us with God, you know. Um, some of us, in, in our worst moments, uh, 
talk about God in a, in a, a bad way, think about God in a bad way, and, and prepare to walk away from God. And yet He still loves us. He's still there for us. And that's uh, an amazing, amazing grace. God will love us until the end. It can't be compared with human love. Without passion, no fits. He doesn't love us one day and hate us the next. His love doesn't go way down and then come back up again to a peak. Uh, that's not the love of God. It has no moods. It has no fluctuations. It's not a fancy of his hope that he wishes he could love us. And the reality is, he does love us, even when we're right and even when we're wrong. The Word of God says his love is as strong as death. It says many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. Nothing can separate us, uh, separate it from those who have embraced it. And that's what we obviously says in Romans chapter th- uh, 8, near the end there as well. What shall separate us from the love of God? What will, we do, what will do it? There are more than conquerors in that love. Death, life, mm-hmm. angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, any other creature shall not be able to separate. Does he miss anything out? Uh, he said, it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what tantrum you're having, I'll love you anyway. God loves us anyway. And you'll work with us through the darkest uh, extreme of our situation. Forever his, forever only his, who the Lord and me shall part, with what peace and rest and bliss, Jesus fills a loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, Firstborn light in gloom decline, but while God and I shall be, I am His, and He is mine. Did you like some of these old poet guys? They're really good at graphics. Better than the modern stuff. I, I think in maybe a hundred years' time, people may, may disagree with that, but I, I think no, on, 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 on. They won't even know how to speak English in a year, <laughs> you know, hundred years' time. They do it from the internet. That may be true. <laughs> uh, he lives forevermore, I am his and he is mine, is the hours. Do we know that, that unchanging love, I don't mean do we know about it, have we experienced that changing love in our lives? Has God made a difference in our lives? Really that's like the, the, the bottom line. And, and does he continue to make, the sad thing is sometimes we really, you know, when we think back to when we first became, well I know Frank you'll have a bit of a problem, when you think back you first became Christians a few years ago, uh, the excitement, the, the, the relief, free from sin, life in Christ, hope of heaven, and then we go to church one week after another week after another week after another week, and it gets all boring here, and we lose our freshness. We lose, we lose the insight we had when we first gave our lives to Christ. That's tragic, really. We need to be, renew our minds day by day, remind ourselves, encourage each other to catch a glimpse again God's, God, God's love. But there's always one thing I think when I read that passage, it uh-huh. says, what can separate us from the love of God? I always think about one thing, sin. Well, that's, mm. that's true. Ultimately, that can do it. Nobody can, uh, that other passage, nobody can take you out of, out of God's hand. But you can walk it. Yeah. You, can, you can go back to the old way of life. Like a, a soul <coughs> returning to its vomit. Uh, but it's I'd be tragic, and I think uh, you know some people say, well, how will a, a non-Christian feels when they when they're locked out of heaven, when they can't get into heaven? I think a bigger problem will be, what can somebody who was a Christian, how can they feel when they walk up to recognize I can't get in there? But I had it and I lost it. But will the non-Christian ever know? Oh yeah, because every stand for it, that's where every knee will bow, every every confess Christ <coughs> Lord, whether they believe it or not, they'll have no option. He'll be standing there. So everybody will ultimately know what they missed. Why are they non Christians? That's the point. If if they're non Christians because having had the opportunity they've rejected it. Yeah. That's a bad situation. If they're non Christians because people like you and me have never told them then we'll have to leave that to God. That's a big... You imagine yeah. standing in the queue, we're, we're, we're going up to heaven, and, and, and somebody just across the street, where we, where we, and we're our neighbours. <coughs> and they say, Roger, you never told me. They never spoke to me about it. 
Yeah. 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 Well, the, the thing is, a lot of people say, you mean I'm not going to get to heaven because I didn't believe in Jesus? No. You, you, don't, you don't get into heaven because you didn't believe in Jesus. You get, won't get to, into heaven because you're a sinner. Mm-hmm. It's a sin that puts you in that situation. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, yes, Q, you, what you say is the Q business. Yeah. You know, standing at the yeah. judgment day. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the deed is already done. Yes, you know, when, you know, when you what? die, you know, yes. I, I can't see this purgatory sort of place that you're no, no. waiting for. No, no, no I'm not saying that, Roger. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> hold, hold on to that idea, okay? When you're in the queue, it's too late. Because you're already, for us, we're already be dead, okay? We've, we've, been, we've been resurrected, that's why we're in the queue. We've been resurrected, okay? But we're not in the queue to be judged for... At that point, all it, it's, to, it's for justice to be seen to be done. That's in right. the sense of, you're in the queue, and somebody's going to say, you had this opportunity. I mean, a lot of people are standing in the queue for, for hell, for example, and they're going to say, I'm going to hell. I didn't deserve <coughs> hell. I, I, you, why am I in, I'm in the wrong queue. Why do you get the idea of a queue? And it was that well, that, uh, exactly. from verse. When you stand before the <coughs> church, you God, when you separate the sheep from the goats, and you stand before the judgment seat of God. I think that's already that's done. A queue. I don't think we need. To, I don't think there'll be a queue, though. I don't. There's a lot of people there, right? What are you going to do? We're trying to describe that now in human terms. I that's know right. that, but I mean, right. I mean <coughs> give the well, just right. it, well, at the same time, those who think they're in the wrong place, don't, don't want to use the word for queue, but the wrong place, they're going to go to hell, and and God said because of their sin, yeah. and they're going to be looking across and, and seeing us. I'm us, I'm here. <laughs> I'm in, on the heavenly side, and they're going to say, well, why is he there? But that's because the I, knew, all, I knew him in life. That's the point of the old judgment, when the books are open, they're not there to see whether you're in or out. As you just said then, very rightly so, justice must be seen to be done. Right. Nobody will be, be banished from the presence of God, not knowing why. That's the whole point. It's not there to decide, let's say, Graham Morrison. I'm not saying that, Frank. Right? Oh, and what's up? Oh, I just about made it. Frank. Okay. In you go. That's I'm not, not it. I'm not no, saying that. Say I'm that. saying, if you're waiting there, the books are open, and somebody in the wrong queue, if I go to hell, or I'm in the wrong place going to hell, he's going to look over, and he's going to see Roger. And he's going to say, why is Roger in the, uh, <coughs> heaven when I'm going to go to hell? Like the rich man and Lazarus. He, he like the rich man and Lazarus. Okay. You, 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 there's a difference there. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but as you said, Roger, that's not the point when judgment is being done. That's when people who are questioning why they're going to the wrong place will be able to see. I, I, imagine, I imagine God's going to have a PowerPoint presentation of your life. All right? If you have, if you think you're in the wrong queue, uh, I didn't get. You're going to say <coughs> I didn't get the opportunity to, to hear about this gospel. Yeah. I didn't get the opportunity to hear about Christ. And God's going to be able to press a button and says archive 58. Right. Somebody else yeah. press the button. Up on the screen, here's a guy comes up and he says, "You know, you believe in Jesus? Yes. You believe in a sinner? And you need a salvation?" And the guy says, "Push off! <laughs> I don't want to hear about it." He says, "God will say to the guy, is that an opportunity?" PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. <laughs> but we here, right? We have a belief. Yes. That our loved ones have gone. Yes. To heaven. That's right. So that's what I mean by the deed is already done. Yes. Oh, but yes. still just the moment moment. you die, the die is cast. Yes. You're, you're that's dead. right. And I don't believe that anybody will stand at the judgment seat to ask the saying, why am I here? I think they'll know. The, the deed is done, the die is cast. It is, Roger. Okay, you're missing, you're missing what I'm saying, oh, all right? <laughs> when you die, there's no turning turn back, there's no change in it. If you're walking with God in life, you you will walk in with God 
outside of life. That's what I mean. The day you die is cursed. Yes, if you're walking with God, without God in life, then you're going to walk with God in afterlife. But, there's, there's still a judgment seat. There's still a justice seat. <sighs> it's not to say... To decide. It's not to decide. No, no. It's, it's a... It's a... It's a Pronounce the verdict. Uh, yes. But, but you still need to be there. Everybody needs to be there to hear the verdict. And that's why some of the... You know, Peter, okay, it's, it's something in the Bible doesn't talk about. So therefore, therefore, it's all speculation. But at some point, somebody who's waiting to hear the verdict, hears the verdict and says, Roger, he is... He's, well, it's obviously in the right place anyway, because he's in the right... whatever he is. Um, Roger is, is one of mine. And somebody's going to say, but I know Roger. How, how, come, right. how come he deserves to get in there and I don't? And God's going to be able to... Because everything that we've ever done is going to be in our brain, and already in our brain. God's going to be able to show us all the lost opportunities or reasons. The reason why Roger's in there is because he's trusted in the blood of Jesus, not because he's a good guy. It's not because he, think, you know, he, he, he cut you up in the motorway one day. That's not why Roger's in there. Or, or that's why Roger's not in there. It, it, it's nothing to do with what you've done in that sense. The only reason Roger's ever going to get into heaven is because he trusts in the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus' blood. He says, somebody told me about Jesus' blood was shed, and I've accepted that. And that's why Roger's not cute. Even though the guy in the <coughs> cube, okay, if you don't like the word cube, but the other guy who's, who's going to hell, even if he lives a better life, even if he's done much, lots of, lots for save the children and raised lots of money and everything else, because he's rejected the blood of Christ to be able to deal with his sin, that's why he's going that way. I think our problem is, we're, we're, trying to make we're, we're talking about something that's eternal and yes. spiritual in human terms. That's right. We're, we're, we're thinking in, in time. Yeah. Time will not exist. That's, that's another fact. I mean, another, yes. another, I think we're going to be faced with conditions we can't even begin no. to imagine no. at the moment. There's a certain concepts where, as Frank has said, justice needs to be seen to be done. Mm. And, and at that point, and, and that's not judgment. Done. That's not judgment yeah, being but, done. Yeah, Your life is already judged by the time you die. You've already made your decisions by the time you die. You're already either trusting in Christ or you're not <coughs> trusting in Christ. You're either yeah. saved by the blood or you're still yeah. in your sin. So when you die, no second chance. But there is still a, a recognition Point. He is appointed a man once to die, but after this, the no judgment. judgment. No, I don't think that. That's not a judgment. If anybody, I don't think there'll be anybody there saying, "Why am I here?" I think they'll be told why the why the why they're there. Yes. I, I, I don't think God's going to. The scripture says that uh, the work will be revealed. Yes. Therefore, whatever life we are living now is being recorded. I believe that yes. all the things we do now is being recorded because he says. Whether the things that you do in the secret shall be made open. Right. So there's, there's other, uh, even the passage in Corinthians that talks about uh, the, the things we have done will be, will be either judged as gold or, or dust or, or, or stuff, whatever. Sure. So it's a different kind of judgment, but it's not for salvation. Mm -hmm. The judgment no, no, is not for not salvation. Right. That's it. I'm going to stand, okay, in, in a hypothetical situation. I'm going to stand before God and I say, look, I spent hours trying to get through to Roger that this is this and this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and God says, you know, what have you got through? Look at him, he's up that in the queue. You were right. He, he, he listened to you and he sorted things out. And, and I'm going to say, here's some, my next door neighbor. I spent hours trying to tell him what, what he needed to do. And, and the next door neighbor is not in the right place. And because maybe I was using the wrong arguments, or because I was, <coughs> I was uh, maybe in my, my heart of hearts, I didn't want him to be saved. So I didn't help him enough to be saved. Or maybe just because She's he, stupid. He, he, didn't want, he didn't want to be saved. Oh and therefore, God. you know, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is there's some things that we do in life we think we've done really well, but in actual fact, <coughs> historically, we, we really didn't do a very good job at all. And there's other things where we look back in life and we, we, and we think, boy, I, I, I made a mess of that. Yeah. And time says, that was when you were really doing well. Yeah. Because it's difficult for us when we do something and say something, to know what we said. How many, how many people do you want to talk to? And it's almost as soon as the conversation is finished, you're walking down the road and think, I wish I'd said, I wish I'd said this instead of that, instead of that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, 
That's the kind of thing God God will help us to understand at the end. That see all the hard work you put into that? That was rubbish. You see all the, the, the hard work you put into this, but you thought you'd failed. He said that was pure gold. You see? No, we're not judged for salvation. But our works will be judged. And we see this dross. I think, I think our problem is we can only think about judgment in human terms. Yeah. And that's it's really what we call an anthropomorphism yeah. when we try to describe God's behavior and God's action and God's character in human terms. Yeah. And if you want to talk about people being saved and being lost and people being judged for their sins, we have to think of a judgment. Yeah. We can't think of anything else. That's right. But that's the best we can do. Yes. And that's why it is confusing. It can be confusing. But, but, but those two lessons you need to take away. When you stand before God for the final judgment, it's not judgment for salvation because you've already decided on your life. You know, it's reward. Right. And and you talked about the passage then, in Corinthians. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, yeah. silver, precious stones. Yeah. That's dealing with, with the Christian reward, not salvation. That's right. So it, that we know uh, John the Baptist say sometimes mention about rose coloured glasses, right? Yeah. Uh, and no like uh, if Jesus when God looks at us, he sees us through Jesus' blood. Yes. So like no, that's better accepted. Do you know what I mean? That's the only thing it's set accept us. Uh, some people say, well, God's gonna accept me, look at him right now, a leaflet's of deliver. I'm looking at the amount of, 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 of doors I've knocked. Uh, I'm looking at that's that's all those external things are all to do with why do we leaflet? Why do we door knock? Was it because we appreciated that God has saved us through Christ's blood, and we want to do something for Him, or are we door knocking and leafleting because we don't do enough of it? We're not going to get saved. We're not going to be saved. We're going to miss out. We want brownie points. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we want, the, we want the judgment scale stacked on our side, yeah. so we're doing lots of things. But God says, that's, you're not, that's you shouldn't right. be doing things to stack a, stack a set of scales. He says, you should be doing it out of appreciation of what God's done for you. He's allowed his son to die for you. He shed the blood that you may have a new life in Christ. And because of that, we work. Because of that, because we care. Saved, not be because not to yeah, be saved. Because we are saved, not because we're, we're, we're wanting to Amen. be saved. Amen. It's interesting, I mean, Paul does <laughs> talk about three types of salvation. He talks about our first initial salvation, salvation from sin. And then he talks about our, our ongoing right, salvation, right, like right. John chapter uh, 1 verse 69 says, the blood <laughs> of Christ continues to cleanse us from mm. sin. So we need to stay in a saved state, mm. yeah. if you like. Yeah. Uh, to use... <laughs> It's use the analogy of the train again. Uh, you know, if we go to Aberdeen from, from Kettering, uh, we've got the first stage where we get on the train. So we've actually caught the train. So that's the first stage. That's our first salvation. And then with all the, all the train stations between here and Aberdeen, we could get offered any one of them. So we've had a choice all the way through life whether to stay on the train or get off the train. But it'd be our choice. No, God, God wants us to stay on the train. That's why he supplied the train to begin. And then there'll be a third kind of salvation, if you like, when actually we have being <coughs> faithful unto death. We've made it. So, right. so Paul talks about this kind of three well, parts of salvation. He says he hath delivered us delivered from us. so great a death, and he doth deliver us, and he continues in to whom us. we trust, and he will yet deliver us. And he forward and that's why, why he says at the end of that Roman letter that you yes. love, Yep. Now is your salvation nearer than when you believe. That's right. So it, it's, it's, a it's an ongoing thing. You see, brother, the thing here is like uh, Brother Frank says, when we try to bring the God into the our land. land. Yeah. Yeah. You see, the Bible is a spirit, talking about spiritual things. Yes. And sometimes... Some passages, some people read it with the physical eyes. meaning and eyes yeah. and got law. Yeah. I remember when I was in Gambia, this passage now that says, 
the blood of Christ continue to cleanse mm -hmm. us. He was deceiving a brother. A brother continue to do bad things and do bad things. Each time you courage me, he tells you that blood of Jesus continue to cleanse you. Mm -hmm. This only, is wrong. Only I said, the same Bible says, shall we continue to sin that sin are bound? No. Mm -hmm. Of course not. That's right. I, I, that's, that's true. Uh, the, 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 <coughs> when you're on the train and, and all the stations up there all the stations are your opportunity to continue in sin to walk off in sin all the more to, to, to get off the train and go back to the old way of life uh, and if you do that then the blood yeah, can't yeah, cleanse you anymore you, you don't wait the destination yeah, do you've you? got to stay on the train to get to the destination you've got to, you've got to continually ask God for forgiveness for the stuff you're doing and if you don't do that then the blood can't have any effect to cleanse you from sin but it only works by our asking for the forgiveness. Yeah. Do you know, well, you could be going across the world, right? Yeah. yeah and something happens, right? You flip out from because anybody's capable of it, yes. right? Yes. And do something in anger, right? And you go across the world and the bus whacks you. You're dead. So that means you're out. No, because uh, this is this is uh, an interesting thing. Frank once did a sermon on it. Okay, a lot of people have the idea. If I do one sin, I'm out. But if I say, ask forgiveness that one sin, I'm back in. The concept of, of out and in, if you like, of losing your salvation, is if, like, as you said, if you then make up a habitual sin, time and time again, with no asking forgiveness and getting it right, uh, then you come to the point where God says, look, I can't forgive you anymore because you really don't mean it. You know, if you say, if, if you had that attitude, the guy that you're talking about, who thinks he can just live any old way he likes, then something goes, uh, you know, forget <coughs> that one, the blood will take care of that one in front. No, it won't work that way. It's not one time sins or one time acts and stuff like that. It's a, a, a habitual life of. We have been saved by Christ's blood from <coughs> our past habitual life of That's sin. Fine. If we make mistakes, if we get it wrong, if we sin occasionally, <coughs> the blood of Christ can take care of that, no problem. But if we take advantage of the fact that God can forgive us and say, well I can do this because I'm going to be forgiven anyway, which is, in a sense is what happens with the, the Roman Catholic concept of, of um, confession. You know, as long as you go into the confession and say, I've done so many things this, this last week, that means I can, I'm, I'm free, I can go out and I can do all the same things again next week, without even thinking about it really. It's, it's the idea of, of if you take advantage of the blood of Christ and then habitually start <coughs> doing things that are against the blood of Christ, you can't come to a point where the blood of Christ can't uh, deal with your sin because you've just gone back into your own way of thinking and your own way of life. But that's totally different from us Christians Everyone, even yeah. Frank, would you believe that even Frank will struggle Even I thought I'd made a mistake once. He will struggle wrong. with something <laughs> until the day he dies. So even in Frank's lifetime, there will be some sin yeah. that has almost like a habitual sin, but it's something that he'll struggle against all his life. It could be a pride, it could be uh, whatever. Paddy, the difference is you're in a different relationship with God. You're a child of God, and consequently as a child of God, you have privileges and rights and opportunities that other people don't have. Even when that prodigal was in the far country, the father said, my son. And then when he came, came back, the father said, my son was dead, but he's now alive again. So you, once you're in the family, the situation is different for you than it is for people who are still outside of God's family. Yeah, but but we can, uh, the Hebrew writer says, we can crucify Christ afresh. We can That's get right. to that point where, uh, as I said before, God <coughs> won't let it, won't, uh, uh, God will keep us in his hands. But if we really want to, we can say, no, I've yeah. had enough. And you can walk away. And God won't stop you doing that because it's your, your choice. Yeah. Yeah. You but, said yes once, yeah. you can say no. Yeah. God didn't make you say yes. You, right. you chose to say yes. So our yes needs to be yes now, yes tomorrow, yes the next week, and next, yeah, we need to continue to be yes. Anyway, over time. But one, one, one thing to remember, the, the, the prophet says, 
God knows our frame. He knows how we're made. How we and remembers that we are dust. So God makes more allowances for you than you make for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the beauty. But it's